let's take, for example, a type one diabetic. A type one diabetic learns very early that if he or she skips insulin injections, they can eat whatever they want. Literally, they can eat. This is a, a problem called diabulimia, where the diabetic learns, I can eat that chocolate cake. And as long as I don't poke myself with this needle of insulin, I will stay as skinny as I want to. And people will say, well, it's because all the excess calories, it, literally, Ben, you could have a diabetic eating 5,000 calories a day, and they will look scrawny if they're not injecting their insulin. Sorry, just to cut you there. One of my best friends was type one diabetic, used to do exactly that, just lost his leg because of it. So yep, interesting. Yep. So, so that's right. So yep. the consequences are catastrophic yep. because they're, key, they're in ketoacidosis and they have, hyper, they have glucose levels that are 10 times higher than what they should be. And the glucose in particular is going to basically start ripping apart blood vessels and, and feeding infections and so losing legs. And so my, my irreverent kind of dark joke on that is the person will die early or, or have you know, serious health consequences, but they'll look great in their coffin. Yep. They'll be as lean as they want to. But imagine for a moment, everyone listening, just how tempting it is for that person. Totally. Because they don't have to go through the physical pain and embarrassment of, say, of, say bulimia. And, and I'm in no way speaking lightly on this. These are serious topics. But with bulimia, for example, it's the physical discomfort of having to vomit and, and, and remove yourself from the social situation and go to the bathroom. And, you know, it, it's terrible. It, it's terrible. But for the type 1 diabetic, they can sit there and eat all of that stuff, and they just don't have to poke themselves with a needle. Oh, my gosh. How tempting would that be to abuse that? Reality, which is you cannot store fat unless your insulin is elevated. Now, again, as I was starting to mention, people will say, well, all those excess calories are just spilled into the urine as glucose. That is absolutely not true. All that glucose that's coming into the urine, accounting for the increased urine production, is just a few hundred calories at most. What people don't appreciate is that when insulin is low, there are multiple variables that create this metabolically elevated state, which makes it easier to be lean. Now, and that is one, an actual, an actual increase in metabolic rate from, from head to toe Metabolic rate is, we know in humans that have just low insulin, not type 1 diabetic, zero levels, low insulin versus high insulin based on meals, the, the, the metabolic rate will differ by 300 calories per day. And so this is the person who has this 300 calorie a day uh, wiggle room um, because their metabolic rate is simply higher when insulin is low. And my lab has studied some of the mechanisms for that. And two, when your body is making ketones, Ketones are a very unique fuel. First of all, they have about the same caloric value as glucose does. So ketones are energetic molecules. They have a calorie load to them. But when someone has ketones, or they're in ketosis, I won't invoke ketoacidosis at this point because we're talking about the non-diabetic now. But they are, remember, a ketone is an energetic molecule and they are breathing them out or urinating them out. So when someone's in ketosis, they are exhaling ketones and they're urinating ketones. Every little molecule of the ketone is an energetic, it was a calorie that if we were just trying to invoke the laws of thermodynamics as, it is, as they are improperly invoked, we would say that you have to either burn it as energy, so exercise more, or you have to put less in the system or eat less. Well, when you're in ketosis, you've introduced this third mechanism, which is waste. You are literally wasting energy from your body. And so, yes, absolutely, calories matter. In that sense, the laws of thermodynamics are relevant, that you have to account for the energy. It's just when we try to account for the energy and the complexity of the human body, not to mention the complexity of having to wrestle with hunger, which I think is a vastly overlooked aspect, which maybe we can come back to. But nevertheless, calories matter. But if you're trying to understand human obesity just through a caloric lens, you will miss it. All you will do is promote hunger. And that will generally result in a short-lived success. You have to consider the role of insulin because it matters. Absolutely. There can be no fat gain in a human without elevated insulin. It is impossible. There can be no fat loss in a human with, unless insulin is low. It's impossible. Yes, calories matter. Energy matters. But so too does insulin. We must invoke both of these variables to truly understand and maybe Ben, if you'll allow me, my one of the reasons I 
am a little frustrated with the pure kind of caloric theory. If I'm going to straw man that argument, which is just, it's purely calories and hormones have nothing to do with it, which is wrong. But if I were to tell the audience uh, that we, I've arranged a, a, a dinner, it's a buffet and the world's best chefs are coming to prepare the most delicious food anyone has ever had. Everyone's invited. It's a buffet. I want you to come and eat as much as you can and just enjoy yourselves. And I would say then, what would the people do that I've invited? What would you do to come as hungry as possible to my party? There are two things you would do. You would start eating a little less in the days before the event, and you'd probably start exercising a little more. And sure enough, that is the perfect way to make sure you're hungry. But that's also the advice we've been giving people for 50 years on how to lose weight. We say eat less, exercise more. Yes, it's the perfect recipe for hunger, which means hunger is generally going to win. Now, I'm not saying there's no value in discipline in, in, in you know, knowing when you've eaten enough and learning how to push the plate away. But even then, that comes back to this idea of satiety. We need to focus on foods that tell our brain, you're good. You're good. You don't need any more. And we don't have to wait until our stomach is bursting to get there. It's that our, 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 our brain knows we are satisfied. And we know from human studies that when insulin is spiked due to consuming refined carbohydrates, that satiety signal is weaker. When insulin is not spiked, like, for example, by focusing on proteins and fats, then satiety is stronger. The satiety signal is, is more prevalent and thus hunger is controlled longer. So this is, I know I've been ranting for quite a bit. I maybe just to kind of bring no, it this back. Is perfect. It's, no, this it's is the, good, good. Well, we, we have to consider the effects of insulin. Um, but I, I, I hate to say that because I know that there's always a certain population that immediately thinks, oh, Bickman's trying to deny calories. I hope I've made that clear. I am uniquely qualified to appreciate energy and, and what it's going to do. But a cell does not know what to do with energy unless it's told. It must be told. Uh, and maybe my, my last point on this, we grow fat cells in my lab, like right across the hall here in a little incubator, we have fat cells growing in little Petri dishes. These fat cells can be swimming in a sea of fats and glucose or fructose or whatever other nutrients we want to put around them, and they will not grow. Not at all. The moment we start bumping up the insulin, boom, now the fat cells start to swell. That is reflective to some degree or another, reflected in every cell of the body. Cells do not inherently know what they need to do with the energy that's around them. Hormones tell the cells what to do.